in-person event or hybrid, but with a lot of in-person participants. So before we start with the scientific um, program, we just wanted to give you uh, some practical information and give you an overview over the program. So um, let me introduce the organizers. So Andrea Gambassi and uh, Benjamin Vata and Edgar Roldan. And my name is Sarah Loos. So, ah, and this is the email address of the secretaries. Whenever you have some issues, you can email this email address and they will try to help you. Okay. Ah, yeah. So, and uh, this is an overview over the program. Um, so we have longer talks in the morning and then um, a second, um, the, the second talks here in orange are a bit shorter and then there come the contributed talks who are even a bit shorter. If you want to go online, you can also see the program here and you can click onto the abstract here to see the abstract of the invited talks. And I explain this because it's a bit complicated to see the booklet of the contributed talks. You have to download it as a separate PDF. And I, uh, you have also a printout of the invited talks and the contributed talks separately here. So um, the talks start every day at 9.15, we have the keynote talks, which are in total 50, uh, 45 minutes, and invited talks are in total 30 minutes, and contributed talks 20, and we will take like five minutes for discussion. Then, very importantly, we have the lunch and discussion break, so please use that time also to have discussions with each other. Then, uh, importantly, the lunch is at the ICTP main building, which is not this building, but it is uh, a building at the main campus of ICTP, and it's about a 15-minute walk. But there will be lunch shuttles, so you can also take the shuttle to go there. Uh, yeah, tonight we have a welcome reception in this building, starting at 6, where you are all welcome to join. Um, tomorrow at 12.20, 12, uh, so after the morning session, we will take a conference photo, so please everybody join that. And we also have the poster session tomorrow at uh, 4.30. So, yeah. Um, this is a snapshot of how the poster session is going to look like for all of you who haven't used Gathertown before. And I think Benjamin wants to say some things about that. Yeah, good morning also from my side and welcome here to Trieste. Um, it's nice to be in a room full of offline participants, but we also have over 40 online participants. And so in order to uh, make the exchange with them possible, we have a poster session tomorrow uh, from 4.30 to 6 p.m. Uh, and the online session is going to take place in Gather Town, which is an arcade-style uh, online platform. Many of you will be familiar with it. Uh, you, have sent, you have received the link, I hope, in an email. Okay. Wonderful. So you just log in there, you choose your avatar, you walk around in this uh, 2D world. You can interact with people. Uh, please use it. So this room is actually open throughout the conference for up to 25 participants at a time. So especially for those who are attending online in the coffee breaks, you can explore the posters, meet other people, uh, get in touch. And tomorrow, so all of Thursday, we have 125 licenses. So all of us can spend as much time as you like in that space, meet with people that couldn't come for various reasons. And uh, yeah, we'd like to encourage all of you to, to make use of this, in particular the online crew. Uh, just have a walk, stroll around, and uh, get in touch with other people. Thank you. So maybe I can add something. So it's, uh, those of you who are, um, so one complaint about Gather Town that I heard in the past was, ah, I, would, uh, I cannot find somebody with whom I would like to talk. There is a search, uh, a search uh, option in Gather Town, which allows you to really, uh, you know, stalk uh, your colleagues. Uh, so you can really follow. So if he's moving, your avatar is following him. So use it. It's very useful to stalk people. Okay. We, are, we are not encouraging to stalk people. Uh, no, no, people. we are not encouraging to stalk people. But, but it's very easy to use and very, very fun. And uh, it's a way also to connect to people which is online. It's, which also, is it's a sort of uh, Pac-Man <laughs> video game uh, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, so lastly, maybe we should mention that during the talks, um, for the online participants, during the talks, uh, you will be muted and you cannot unmute yourself to ask a question. But you can write us in the chat and we can unmute you. And then after the talks, you will be unmuted and you can also ask questions in the chat, hopefully. Uh, 
Yeah, and um, okay, this is just an overview of this building so that you know where are the restrooms and this is the lecture hall that we are currently in. And this is uh, the map of the ICTP campus. So we are right now in this building, but the uh, lunch is going to be in this building. So we can all walk together, don't worry, <laughs> you will not get lost, but just so you know that this is a different building and in between is this big park. Uh, and there's also the shuttle, so. Um, yeah, I think this is all that we wanted to say. I don't know if you'd want to add something. Uh, read? Yes. Ah, okay. <laughs> so yeah, so we just wanted to put here uh, a very nice paper that uh, maybe some of you already know from uh, Van Kampen who made a very nice um, summary of why it is important to look at non-Markovian processes and a very important remark that he made is uh, his first remark, non-Markovian is the rule and Markov is the exception. And on that note, I think we can turn on to the scientific program. And I hope you all enjoy this conference. Thank you. Okay, do you hear me? Yes, very good. Good morning, welcome everyone. I have been volunteered to be your chair for this morning. Um, there is the agreement that questions should be asked during the talks if someone has an urgent question. Letizia, are you fine with that? Sorry? If someone asks questions during yeah, the yeah, talk. Yeah, very good. Stop yeah, please yeah. I will not be very strict on tracking time. Um, I trust that all the speakers will keep their slots. Uh, I'm optimistic. Good, so the first speaker is Letizia Cugliandolo. Um, from Paris, and um, she will talk about non-Markovian effects in many body systems. Uh, please, Okay, welcome. thank you. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to come to Trieste, so thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, what I planned is to make a sort of introduction on non-Markovian effects, and I will pick three cases or three broad uh, subjects, which are actually the subjects of the three um, days of the conference. So. These names which appear here are people whom, uh, with whom I collaborated in the past on uh, some of the um, results that I will show you, uh, but I will not be very specific about you know, the, the problems themselves. It's more like a global introduction that I will make. So uh, this is the way in which I organized this introduction. So at the beginning, I will talk about classical systems, give some definitions and uh, properties and the physical origin of um, you know, non-Markovian effects in the kind of equations that we use in, in physics. And then I will talk about uh, you know, some biological applications at the single particle level, many body effects, glassiness, how these appear in the description of glassy problems, and, um, and specifically, explicitly, non-equilibrium problem, uh, which is, uh, you know, the field of active matter. And then, well, depending a little bit on time, I will give you some ideas about non-equilibrium effects on um, quantum systems. So I also <laughs> picked this uh, um, article from Van Kampen uh, to start with my talk. So as um, it was said, no Markov is the rule. This is the pointer is here? No. Okay, I don't know which is the point. Anyway, so no Markovian is the rule, uh, is uh, not the exception, and um, it is just not proper to treat non Markovian processes as just little modifications of uh, Markovian ones. So there is, you know, more flesh into them, let's say. Uh, so let me pick a definition. Imagine that you have a stochastic process, you have time, you discretize this time, so you have three other times, T1, T2, and T3, and uh, say that the stochastic process is this X of T, uh, taking values at these times that I selected. So the joint probability distribution of these three values of X at the three times, um, which is uh, this capital P3 that I wrote over there, uh, well, it satisfies, uh, you know, the fact that it's the product of the probability of uh, the joint probability distribution of the variables at the two 
first times and then times this conditional probability uh, of going from these values at the two previous times to the value at the third time here. Uh, so for a Markovian process, which is special, is that this thing here just becomes, this conditional probability just depends on the next uh, variable uh, to the one you're focusing on. Okay, so this dependence here disappears and this depends only on the just previous one. Um, this is a special feature of Markovian processes and non-Markovian processes are those that don't satisfy this property. Uh, so uh, one can generalize what I have just said and consider the values of this stochastic process at n times, orders in the same way as before, then you have the joint probability distribution of the values of the variable at all these times, and uh, using what I have just said previously and extended it, extending it to uh, the n variable case, uh, what it turns out is that this joint probability distribution is just the product of these transition probabilities or conditional probabilities uh, defined before, but just depending on the two nearest times considered and times the probability of the initial value. Okay, so uh, this is very practical for calculations, of course, if you can factorize in this way, but for non markovian processes, you cannot. So this is sort of the mathematical setting. You can find it uh, in a very similar description in uh, Van Kampen's review article. So um, what are the effects, the simplest effects of uh, these um, um, no mark of vianity. So on the left, I just picked from Barkema's book um, a, a realization of a random walk. So in the left panel, the random walk is not constrained. So at each step in the evolution, the walker can go to any of the nearest neighbors on the lattice with equal probability. And in particular, it can come back to a point which was already visited uh, with no restriction. So it can overlap in the way it's uh, sketched over there. So this is the Markovian case is not constrained at all uh, in the evolution. While on the right side, there is a self-avoiding walk. So it's a walk that remembers everything that happened before. And it remembers it in the way that it cannot overlap. It cannot go twice on the same site. And uh, if you have a look at it, it's well, a little bit more expanded, no? I mean, not really in this picture, but what will happen in the end is that because of the fact that it cannot go back to points which here were already, already visited, uh, it will uh, expand a little bit. And this is what is shown in this figure here, uh, which I took, uh, well, okay, I didn't take it from there, but it's uh, an example that you can see in Doi and Edward's uh, book on uh, polymer dynamics. So uh, if you allow for overlapping of the random walk, and this is uh, just a modeling of a, a polymer, what it can do, if it can go on top of itself, uh, the radius of gyration, so roughly you know, how much big it is, uh, will scale with the number of monomers with uh, one half power, like in a normal random walk in a sense, while uh, here in the self-avoiding case, well, the power is different, is higher, so this is the expanding feature that I was mentioning. So they are uh, visual and you know, consequences, uh, visual effects and consequences of these constraints that are imposed uh, with the non-Markovianity in this example here. I don't know, maybe for the ones who ask questions uh, online, I reply only later, right? This is the, the idea. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so maybe it's better if I do it later for the ones who are not here because it will take time to read and, no? Yeah, I guess. Sorry? But there is a raised hand over there. Yeah. If, I mean, can he talk? No. Okay, so then, <laughs> so then I'll do it later. <laughs> so here I just, <coughs> I did an example um, about uh, what happens with an exponentially correlated uh, problem. I will jump over this one. It's not very important what, what I, I want to say. I prefer to spend more time in the, the physical origin in particular uh, of these uh, non-Markovian. So 
imagine now that instead of thinking about these um, random walk problems I, I told you about before, let me try to give an idea of where this uh, memory can come from uh, in a problem described à la Langevin. Okay? So the idea is that I will think about, I have some system, and this system I will couple to some environment, and it will interact with the environment in some way. So I will model the system in the simplest possible way. I will think of it as a particle, just a particle, characterized by a position and a momentum, the x and the p over there. And then I will model as well the environment in some way, simplest as possible, and I will model it with a harmonic oscillators, you will see, which are also characterized by positions and momenta. And the A is an index that labels how many harmonic oscillators you have, and I don't put arrows nor bowls because I think in one dimension because it's simple. Uh, so one can ask the questions, what are the static and the dynamical behavior of the reduced system? So what do I mean by the reduced system? Well, I have the coupled system, but I will like to integrate out, so get rid uh, with a calculation of the explicit dependence on the environment and the interaction, but then this will imp imply necessarily some change in what the system will feel. And I want to characterize this change. And I want to understand you know, how much it influences the equilibrium behavior of the system, the dynamics of the system, and later on I will say a couple of words about the quantum extensions of that. So, as I said, the simplest possible modeling is to consider, uh, well, harmonic oscillators at the back. Uh, I will have to give initial conditions to my system. I will have to give initial conditions to the oscillators. Uh, when I focus on the system, of course, the energy of the system is no conserved. It's not conserved, but the energy of the full coupled system plus environment ensemble is conserved because I consider it isolated from the rest of the world. Uh, and in the modeling, one also considers that the system is small compared to the environment, because if you model an environment, a bath, you imagine that it's a huge object with a lot of degrees of freedom. So this is a sketch uh, of what I'm thinking about. I have my particle, perhaps subject to some potential, and coupled to all these oscillators, mm, many of them, that consist, uh, that make the bath, that are the elements of the bath. So then one can uh, give a modelization, say how one's going to describe the coupling between the system and the bath. I said that the bath were oscillators. I know which is the Hamiltonian of the oscillators. It's very simple, it's a quadratic thing. And then I have to choose the coupling. So the simplest possible coupling is one uh, given over there. So x is the position of the particle, qa is are the um, positions, if you wish, of the oscillators with respect to their equilibrium um, positions. And then you see that here what I have is a bilinear coupling of x and qa because if I expand the squared, okay, I have a double product, right? So this is a simplest modeling of uh, environment and interaction and it was already considered by Feynman in the quantum context in the 50s and uh, other people which uh, Kawasaki, Swansea, uh, a bit later. So if you want to solve this problem, what do we have to do? I have to consider the coupled Newton equations of the particle and the oscillators. The equations for the oscillators will be linear because I'm working with oscillators because this is the reason why I chose them, to make the calculation feasible. I can integrate these Newton equations of the oscillators. They will depend the solution on the position of the particle because they are coupled. I inject the solution of the Newton equations of the oscillation, oscillators in the equations of the particle, and then I get a final equation for the particle alone. Okay? Alone in the sense that only the variables of the particle appear, but the influence of the oscillators will be uh, there in that equation. Now, if you assume, because everything I said up to now is completely deterministic, it's just Newton's equations and solving Newton's equations. If you assume that the initial distribution of the oscillator variables is of Gibbs-Boltzmann kind with some inverse temperature put by hand in this calculation there, then what you will find is a color Langevin equation, so a Langevin equation with memory and noise which is correlated. In the classical case or in the quantum case, something a little bit more complicated, what is called a reduced dynamic generating function. If I have time, I will come to that at the end of my talk. 
But just focus on the classical case for the moment. Is it moving? Ah, something happened here. Ah, the connection is lost. Mm. This is this is the Zoom or my computer? I don't know. Yeah. Probably it's the internet connection. No. Connection lost. Connection lost. But the internet is on. Yeah, you're on. I think it's just slow. Okay, try sharing again. Uh, but the. Uh, Oh, there it is. No? Yep. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well. So, <coughs> why don't we worry about this in classical equilibrium? I mean, nobody told you about this in classical equilibrium, right? You just have a system. You say it's coupled to a bath, and you do the Gauss-Boltzmann measure, with no problem. So, the thing is that if I do the same calculation at the level of the partition function. So if I think about the partition function as a sum over environmental and system degrees of freedom, and I integrate over the, the environment degrees of freedom, which are they are quadratic, I can do it, uh, then what you will get is some reduced partition function, which is modified with respect to the original one by this term over here. But because of the coupling that I chose between the system and the environment, there is also a contribution that is exactly the same as this one, you cancel them, and you get that the reduced partition function is equal to the system's one. So at the level of the calculation of the partition function, the effect of this coupling to the environment, for this environment I chose, goes away, disappears. So then, you know, you can think about what we usually do. We never think about what is the environment at the classical level and at the equilibrium level, right? We always say, okay, we just write the partition function and, and that's it. But at the level of the dynamics, uh, no, at the level of the dynamics, if I do the procedure that I mentioned with words before, sorry, uh, then what I get, oh, sorry, then what I get is a generalized Langevin equation of this kind, where there is a kernel here, which is the friction kernel, that depends on times, and all the times that uh, been run, have been run since the initial time of the evolution, and there is a noise over there which is correlated with this same kernel, the same one here and there, if you chose initial conditions for your environmental variables which are in equilibrium at beta. And this is the inverse of beta which appears here. So the assumption of equilibration of the bath leads to a delayed Langevin equation with color noise but with a relation between the friction kernel and the noise kernel which is just proportional to KBT. And this is, uh, well, what is uh, um, a representation of the fluctuation dissipation relation that tells you that the environment is in equilibrium. So uh, these are the references I mentioned. And if you want to see then these calculations done in detail, this book here presents them. Uh, again. Is it moving? Hmm. There's again the same problem here. Is it moving now? Yeah. Okay, so the familiar white noise limit uh, is obtained when this sigma that was appearing here becomes the delta function proportional to the friction coefficient. And then also you have the delta correlation of the noise uh, that, um, that uh, you know for uh, you know, wide noise Langevin equations. As I mentioned, the constraint on the kernels, the fact that I am assuming that they are the, system, the environment was in equilibrium, constrains this sigma in the friction to be the same as the sigma in the correlation noise. But in other problems, you can have non-equilibrium baths and then you know, don't respect this relation. Now, what is the... Uh, effect of the different choices of oscillators. You can choose oscillators of different kinds. So you can choose ensembles of oscillators with their own frequencies being distributed in some 
different ways, right? So according to how uh, these oscillators are chosen, uh, you choose this function i of omega, which is there, which is the spectral function of the bath, and you can get different baths. So this black thing here is a white bath, uh, but then you can have colored baths, colored noises, uh, that will give you, uh, you know, i of omegas, which have different dependencies on the frequencies. And, uh, okay, this I took from some other radio article over there. And uh, the names omic is usually associated to white noise, but then you can have superomic or subomic, depending on how these i of omegas depend on omega at, long, uh, at large values of omega, whether they, 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 how they decrease with omega or whether they increase with omega and so on. Um, there is a case, a special case, that will appear later in the active matter context, which is the case of having this kernel sigma v of exponential form, so v an exponential function. Although it's not a delta, and you could imagine that this leads to a non-Markovian process, this problem, in the usual cases, can be um, disentangled, let's say, by introducing an auxiliary variable or by considering this psi uh, to be given by another Langevin equation, this one with a white noise, and this is the ornstein ullenbeck uh, well-known process that is actually when you open it up and you include this as a dynamical variable itself, the xi, um, you realize that, okay, you just have two equations um, coupled together, but you don't see the memory any longer. So the special exponential correlated noise is a little bit special. But then whatever else you can have, if you have, uh, you know, power law decays, which correspond to the power laws of the I of omega that I mentioned beforehand, uh, well, then you have, you know, proper long-term memory in the uh, characterizations of the path. Uh, okay, this one I can jump. Now, okay, from the point of view of the calculations, uh, you know that uh, when you have a Langevin equation with a white noise and with no inertia, so where you drop the second time derivative, there are lots of, uh, you know, peculiarities of those equations that ha have to be taken with care. The discretization that you use to consider them uh, has to be considered in great detail, especially if you have what is called uh, multiplicative noise, so on and so forth. These things are smooth, are, you know, softened, let's say. These problems are sort of uh, avoided if you have correlated noise. So from the point of view of uh, discretization issues, uh, having correlated noise is helpful, is simpler. Mm? You don't have to worry about those problems. But, okay, then there are other problems that appear, mm -hmm. which is linked to the fact that those equations are more difficult to solve. So there is, you know, a gain and a loss in uh, considering correlated noise and, and problems with memory. Then I just want to mention very briefly that there are certain uh, generic results of uh, non-equilibrium and equilibrium systems that evolve with these Langevin processes that can be proven, like, for example, the fluctuation dissipation relations in and out of equilibrium. Those can be proven in very similar ways if you have uh, memory and correlated noise like this. So all these things remain. So fluctuation dissipation theorems and fluctuation theorems out of equilibrium are still valid for processes uh, with memory and correlated noise if those are in equilibrium, right? Okay, so now what else can I say? Well, what I can say is that the effects of uh, this non-Markovianity appear at all levels. So, for example, the simplest possible problem you can imagine is a particle moving in a harmonic potential coupled to a bath. So if I couple this problem to a bath with... Um, power law correlations in time, like the ones I mentioned before, and you consider, for example, the measurement of the correlations of the position of this particle at different times, well, for a white noise, you would find an exponential decay. For a correlated noise, you have an ugly function there, which has a name and that has in some serious representation, uh, which is not exponential. So it's the decay of uh, these correlations is still stationary in the sense that it depends on the time differences, but it depends on the time differences in a complicated manner. And the characteristics of the bath are encoded here in this alpha, which is the alpha that characterizes the decay of the power law correlations in time, and that will uh, give you different functions here. Okay? So the bath has an explicit effect in the dynamics 
on the dynamics of the particle, even in this very simple problem. This has been used by these people, for example, uh, who were doing experiments on some proteins, and they were looking at something similar like the correlation function I mentioned before. So experimentally, they measure this correlation function and they see some decay as a function of time difference. So this T here is time difference. And this decay is not exponential. It's something that looks asymptotically like a power law, but it has some you know, functional form, which is, uh, well, more or less complicated. And what they do is they fit with uh, this metadata left there function that I mentioned before, and from there they extract the alpha of the bath. So what they want to do in these experiments is to characterize the environment where these proteins are moving, and they do it by just you know, doing the same calculation or applying the result of the same calculation I gave you before, and like this they characterize the bath. Similar problems uh, were treated recently by uh, Andrea and collaborators and David Venturelli, his student. Uh, so for example, this is a very similar situation where you have a particle moving in a harmonic potential, which is this term here, but it's coupled to an environment which, for example, can represent a surface on which this particle is moving. And this surface is rough, or this surface is characterized by a field. Huh? Here is the field, and here is the coupling between the particle and the field. And then, okay, you have a problem where this plays the role of the environment, this is the particle you want to characterize, and this is interaction. So it's very similar to, to what I was just saying. I, if you want more details, you can see David's poster. Now, how these things at the level of single particle that I mentioned just before generalize to a more complicated situation where you have, for example, many particles in interaction, competition, and then slow dynamics and glassiness. Can this you know, be used to what we have just learned to say something about this more complicated problem. And here what I want to tell you is about some old ideas actually from, you know, like 20 years ago. And uh, the idea is, let me think in the same terms I have done it, but now consider that I have a particle coupled to two baths. Okay, I still have a particle with some potential which can be a harmonic potential, but then it's coupled to two baths. And the two baths are different. So one is white and the other one is exponentially correlated. This makes my calculation simple. It's not necessary to choose this, but this makes calculations easy. And not only the kernels are different, the temperatures are different. So imagine that one has T1, the other one has T2. So my particle is explicitly set out of equilibrium by this coupling to these baths, which are different, evolve in different scales and have different temperatures. So this problem, of course, can be solved analytically. It's very simple. If I put a potential which is, again, harmonic. And what turns out is that the correlation functions of the positions of the particle under these two baths become relatively complex. So there are two time scales that develop hmm, when I choose the tau that characterizes the exponential decay of the bath uh, to be very large. So when I put my baths, I set my baths to be very different to evolve in different scales. So there is a short time scale here, which is controlled by the white bath, and there is a long time scale here, which is controlled by the color bath, the exponentially correlated one. And this is the sort of things that are seen in glasses. So in glasses, you see this separation of time scales. It's self-induced by the interactions of the particles among them. Here I'm just considering one particle. There is another feature that can be solved completely in this simple problem, which is to have a look at fluctuation dissipation relations for the particle. So for those of you who don't know it, don't worry so much, there is a relation between linear response and correlation functions that in perfect equilibrium is completely controlled by the temperature of the bath, if you have only one bath, but here I have two at different temperatures, and what I see is that I have a regime here controlled by the white bath, another regime controlled by the color bath. And this regime here corresponds to short time delays. This corresponds to long time delays. So this is uh, the explicit solution of the equations that I showed you before. Now I compare to what happens in glasses, and you see it's very similar. These are simulations of a Leonard Jones system with these two time scales developing. Uh, here, when you increase waiting time, but you can also do it in the same way when you get close to the glass transition. 
just look at this and this is very similar. Look at that and that is also very similar, right? So I have induced the very features of out of equilibrium glassy dynamics in a trivial problem of a particle coupled to two baths. So the idea is that what's going on in a glass? Well, there is an effective description of uh, all these many body problems, which consists in saying, okay, I will pick some relevant variable. This relevant variable will follow some effective dynamics. Of course, I cannot solve analytically for these dynamics. I cannot show, you know, prove um, in all details which the, these dynamics will be. But I can make a guess, and in certain cases, like large dimensionality, mean field models, and so on, I can do this calculation analytically. And the thing that turns out is that what you get is that for this selected variable, you get an effective Langevin equation with delayed friction and with noise, which is correlated. And in out of equilibrium situations, like the ones you have in glasses, this delayed friction and this correlated noise are not linked by you know, the usual fluctuation dissipation relation of an equilibrium bath because this effective bath is the system itself. And the system itself in glasses is out of equilibrium. So the relation between these two, a priori you don't know it. But in practice, is the one that is characterizing these fluctuation dissipation relations I showed you before in the, in the problem, in the previous slide. So, what you have to keep in mind here is that there is a way in certain case, cases to prove, in other cases to guess, an effective Langevin equation for the relevant variable that describes the problem. Uh, and it's by construction, uh, uh, it has memory and it has correlated noise. Okay, this one I can jump. It's just the details of what I said. And this is the summary uh, of, uh, you know, going back to the same figures I showed you before and, and giving this explanation for them. Now, active matter, uh, well, you know what active matter is, perhaps, is uh, just an ensemble of objects in interaction as well, but with consumption of energy at the level of the individuals. So the injection of energy is made at the level of each agent in interaction, and then you can have birds, you can have artificial things, you can have grains, have many scales and many, many um, uh, realizations of this idea of, you know, inputting energy at different levels, at, at the microscopic level in these interacting problems. And typically what this uh, in in introduction of energy is doing is that the level of the single particle is changing its motion. So this just is the motion that you would have with no injection of energy, when you have you know, some injection of energy, what typically will happen is that this uh, energy will be used to displace, uh, to move in space, and you will have long runs uh, before turning and you know, making some kind of random motion. But it's like a persistent random motion in the sense that you know, it goes uh, straight in one direction or almost straight in one direction before turning and making its, its motion. So this can be modelized, for example, by adding a local force on each of the particles, uh, which has a zero mean, but has some correlation in time, because you have this, you know, it's not changing madly, it's uh, you know, keeping some direction over relatively long periods of time. And typically what is done is that it's chosen active forces of this kind, which are correlated with some exponential decay. So typically this F is chosen to be exponential with some prefactor um, that gives you an idea of how strong this force is. So at the level of the Langevin modelization, uh, what is used is something like this. So you have you know, inertia, you have a white bath. They just consider the normal bath to be white, so delta correlated, and this is the usual friction term. Then you have some external potential or some interacting potential between the particles. You have these active forces, and you have the normal noise associated to this friction. So these two uh, are in normal relation with the, you know, the delta correlation here as the delta that appears there, but this one doesn't have an associated friction term. So if you think about this one as a noise, it's a noise without friction. So it's a noise that doesn't respect the fluctuation dissipation between you know, noise and friction. So it's a non-equilibrium, explicitly non-equilibrium noise. And then, uh, although this 
Correlations for a fact are usually taken to be exponential, as I said, in time. You cannot play the game of the ornstein ullenbeck process and disentangle these correlations for two reasons. One is that, okay, um, you, now you have two baths, so it's a little bit like the example of the two baths with different temperatures that I mentioned before and different time scales that I mentioned before, but also because there is no associated friction with that. So there is some missing uh, object, and then you cannot do uh, this kind of disentangling. And then the system is explicitly out of equilibrium because of this non-equilibrium uh, force that is acting on the particles. Now, these um, problems are very rich, you know, because now you have you know, lots of possibilities. Depending on the strength of this non-equilibrium force, which I'm characterizing here by this piclet, if I move in this direction, I'm injecting more energy in the system. If I go in these limits, I go to the passive case. But then in the vertical direction, I have the packing fraction, so the density, global density of the system. Here I'm like a gas, over there I'm like a solid. I have a lot of particles. So there is also you know, the temperature of the bath that I could have included as a third axis, but I'm fixing it. In already this plane of a phase diagram that I'm building here, there are many phases with lots of interesting properties. But in particular here, there is a phase which is called motility-induced phase separation, where the system likes to phase separate into dilute and dense regions in space. And typically what you see uh, if you look at the um, configuration is that there is kind of a... Um, a ball, let's say, this is two-dimensional uh, simulations. So you have regions which are very dense, regions which are very dilute. You have bubbles within the dense regions, you have a lot of structure over there. This is what happens in that region, gray region of the phase diagram. And the reason why uh, the system likes to phase separate is basically because of the collisions uh, between the particles that are pushed by this active force. And when they collide, they start colliding like this and they aggregate, right? Because another one comes and, you know, it's also pushing in the same direction, like it's a sketch here, and this grows and makes these uh, big, uh, dense uh, regions. But then, the, you know, the particles turn and then they want to open up and then the bubbles open up and all these strange things happen. Now, what are we trying to do with the people in body is uh, we are trying to get an effective description of the motion of these clusters because there's a lot of nice things that can be said observed in numerics and also in experiments about the motion of these clusters. They break up, they uh, recomb recombine, I don't know how to say, they recombinate, let's say. Uh, okay, there are lots of interesting things. So what is the effective motion of these clusters? Can I write an effective Langevin equation for the center of, of mass motion of these objects? This is the question we are trying to answer. And it's sort of a difficult question. We don't still have an answer, but we're working on that. But just to give you an idea of what we are doing, uh, we're trying to characterize, for example, the total force felt by a cluster. So it's just sum over all the local individual forces, active forces, that are acting on each of the particles, I sum over them, and I have the total force. And how is this total force, yes, uh, correlated? Turns out that it's correlated exponentially in time, or decorrelates exponentially in time, I can extract a typical characteristic time, I can extract the prefactor. I can see how the prefactor depends on the mass of the cluster, and well, it depends on linearly f squared on the mass of the cluster. I can do these sort of things to characterize the effective force acting on the clusters. And then I can say, well, okay, how does, do the clusters move? I can look at the diffusion coefficient of the clusters, how they depend on the active force, how they depend on the mass of the cluster, and try to see which is the Langevin equation that I have to write to reproduce that. So this is the sort of things uh, we are doing. As I said, it's not finished because uh, there are certain things we don't understand yet, but okay, it's work in progress, and it goes in the directions of finding the effective Langevin equation for one variable, the center of mass of the cluster. There are alternative uh, studies that go in the direction of uh, mean field models, infinite dimensional settings, and there are many people who, who work on that. We did in the past a very old paper uh, where we were considering asymmetric exchanges, and then these were the things that were injecting force in the system. Okay, there are more recent papers, more focus on the active uh, problems themselves. 
And now, last thing, you know, quantum, very quickly, just for Friday's interaction. So I said at the classical level that at the level of the partition function, you don't have to worry. But what happens at the quantum level, if I look at the equivalent, let's say, of the partition function, that would be the density matrix. So if I redo this calculation of integrating away the oscillators in the quantum problem, I end up with something that has also a quadratic dependence on the x's, as appeared in the classical case, but with a kernel within, which depends on times. This is Matsubara time, I'm in equilibrium, okay, I go fast here. There is no way to kill this with a counter term in my problem. So even at the level of the equilibrium properties of the problem, I have an effect, strong effect, of the bath. And how does this um, makes, influences the behavior of the system? So one of the things that it does is that it changes the phase transitions of this problem. So imagine I have a quantum problem coupled with uh, some bath. So it's an omic bath of oscillators as the ones I had before. This is the parameter that controls the phase, the, um, the, the, um, the strength of the quantum fluctuations compared to the thermal ones. So this is the, like the quantum parameter. And then you see that depending on how strong the bath is, the transition of this problem, which is represented by this jump here in the susceptibility, occurs at different values of the gamma. So the stronger the bath, the wider, the more extent you have of the low uh, gamma phase. So imagine that this is a ferromagnetic phase, let's say, and this is a paramagnetic phase, and moving the position of the transition of the ferromagnetic phase with the coupling to the bath. This is very strange, right? At the classical level, we don't have that in equilibrium. At the quantum case, you do. So these are things which are used in the context of quantum systems now to you know, impose something on a system via the coupling to the bath. And there are also effects, uh, dynamical effects. The, you can change the dynamics of the system by coupling two different baths. Okay, this I can jump over. So what did I do? Uh, okay, I gave you just an introduction, a bit, a bit fast perhaps, uh, on you know, some non-Markovian effects on many body systems. Uh, I gave you examples, uh, some are unfinished, as you saw in the case of the active matter problem. Uh, but okay, the idea is that you can manipulate the bath in many situations to impose something on the system. And uh, you can also try to imagine that parts of your system are like a bath acting on selected variables and then try to consider how this environment, which is the system itself, influences the behavior of the selected variable. This is what I did in the glassy problem. Okay, three areas of the conference. Enjoy the conference. Thank you for the invitation again. Thanks, Letizia, for this very nice and extended overview and essentially very excellent introduction into the conference. Uh, first, are there questions in the room? So, real person questions? Everyone is still shy? Then I will ask one. Yeah. I know that you explicitly said that you will not talk about it, but what happens if your coupling between the bath and the system is non Quadratic. Okay, if the part that concerns the system is non-quadratic, you can go ahead, and this will give you multiplicative noise. So if you choose something like, uh, I was calling X the system, and QA's uh, the oscillators. So if you couple this via some QA, CA, sum over A, and here you put a function of the X, uh, then it's okay, because this one is linear. Yeah. And you can do the same calculations I've done, and this will appear, something that depends on this, will appear multiplying uh, the noise. Okay, right. and if, if so the Q is nonlinear? Uh, so if the Q is nonlinear, you cannot do uh, you know, explicit calculations, but then you can do some approximations. So for example, do, do, the quantum people do. So, so do, does the qualitative physics change appreciably if you do that? I mean. Uh, it, it may, yes, because it will give, you know, everything depends on the characteristics of the bath. So uh, if you change the characteristics no, of the Because I think that even the, the, the memory term then becomes yeah. a function. It's not a product, right, of the kernel and the, yeah. and the Q value. Yes, right? yes, oh, sorry, then they can uh, be much more complicated, of uh, course. Yes. Then, then the question becomes nonlinear. 
Non no, linea, yeah. Uh. Yeah, so then you can do some, for example, perturbation. So when you have fermionic bath, people usually do some perturbation, mm. approximation on the fermions to, uh, to get some explicit, uh, you know, equations, but it's approximated. So there is still room for people, the younger generations, to start working on the Markovian dynamics <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, in yeah. that sense. <laughs> There's lots of things Good. to be done, yeah. There was a question there first, yes. Uh, Ah, you can, you can, because uh, in the example I showed, which was uh, a bath which was white and a bath which was exponentially correlated with t minus t prime, uh, as the uh, uh, there you don't because everything is stationary. But if you choose a bath which has correlations, a kernel, you know, the sigma of the bath, which has a sigma that depends on the two times separately, then you can get aging as well, even for the oscillator under this bath. You can get it, yeah, because you can, you do, you know, if you choose a sigma b uh, of t on t prime, which is some function of uh, t prime over t, for example, oh. then you impose it on the behavior of the particle. Yeah. So I think there is a question in the chat. Yeah. There was also there. Sarah. Yeah, here. Sarah, you will need, there. so. Yeah. yeah you can. No, I don't see. Ah, well, I ah. don't see it either. <laughs> Sarah, Maybe I ask yeah, ask a question. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, the same also holds for the bath, probably, right? So also the bath is, should be influenced by the particle. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. But so it, how can you then make an assumption on the... On the okay. Usually what you assume is that the bath is so big okay. that, you know, the system doesn't influence the bath. Yeah, but yeah. of course, this is not necessarily true. You can have, a, you know, a couple system where, okay, maybe your focus is on something smaller, but the other one is not in the thermodynamic limit. So then you have to take yeah, care. And then it's getting very complicated, yeah. yeah. I, have to check the chat <coughs> I have to In the meantime, are there any other questions here? Otherwise, we will start with the, with the chat, if we can. Uh, I don't know if I see it. Yeah, it's here. Are there known oh. results if the bath particles themselves are non-equilibrium? Well, it's a bit like here, no? The answer to, to that question, in the example of the... Um, of the single particle coupled to two baths, if I choose uh, the bath to be characterized by a sigma like that one, uh, this is non-stationary. So then it's out of equilibrium. And then I can you know, set the, uh, the system itself out of equilibrium, even in a case where I can consider a particle moving in a harmonic potential, which is like a very simple and one good naively expect equilibrium dynamics, but if you couple to something like this, it's, you will keep it out of equilibrium. Good. But there, the generalized Langevin equation still satisfies FDT? But no, no. No, okay. no because the, uh, when I put these two baths with different characteristics, uh, different time scales and different temperatures, uh, there is no single temperature characterization, neither of the Langevin equation nor the motion of the particle. Yeah. Good. So any other questions should be addressed later. You can write them, I guess, in an email if there are any additional ones. And then let's thank Letizia once again. Thank you.